Sydney has been undergoing a decade of constant urban renewal, which has shown no signs of slowing down. At the centerpiece of this mission has been Barangaroo. Barangaroo is one of the most beautiful and visually stunning areas in Sydney. From Barangaroo Reserve to the cutaway, to the beautiful foreshore walk, to the bustling restaurant and shopping scene, to a grand upcoming station on the new Sydney Metro, to some of the most innovative in architectural design, including the admittedly controversial but nevertheless stunning One Barangaroo. It's easy to see why Barangaroo is quickly becoming a favourite to visit among Sydney siders. But did you know that just 10 years ago, Barangaroo was nothing more than a concrete slab. Yes, that's right. Where I stand right now was literally a concrete slab. This is the story of the complete transformation of a former shipping yard into Sydney's newest vibrant and bustling leisure space. A transformation that most certainly has not been without controversy, but one that I think could easily be Sydney's most successful urban renewal project in recent memory. Before I continue, massive shout out to my monthly Kofi supporters. Please do consider supporting me over on Kofi if you can. I've just introduced two new membership tiers, so be sure to go and check those out after the video. Also, massive news, I've just launched my store. That's right, you can finally buy Building Beautifully merch. There's this shirt, this hoodie, and even this metro map that I designed for my Sydney Metro proposal video. Even better, the first 20 people to enter the code on screen will get 20% off their order. Be quick! Or, if you're a Kofi supporter, you can get 20% off one order at any time. Alright, on to the video. I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Barangaroo land, the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders watching this video. The land that Barangaroo sits upon today was used by the Gadigal people for thousands of years for hunting, fishing and congregation. Indeed, Barangaroo was actually an Aboriginal woman who was alive during the early days of Australia's colonisation. She was married to Benelong, an Aboriginal man whom Benelong Point, the location of the Sydney Opera House, is named after. She's been described as a fiercely independent woman who refused to bend to the ways of the Europeans who she saw as threatening her way of existence. In the 1800s, wharves were built to allow for shipping trade, and this only expanded into the 1900s. Back then, the area was referred to as East Darling Harbour. With the creation of shipping containers, the wharves were destroyed and a massive concrete shipping apron was constructed in the 60s and 70s. Large, domineering, ugly and hideous. To build such a massive concrete apron right next to the city was nothing short of questionable and short-sighted. But, well, urban planning was far different back in the 60s. Cities were designed to accommodate the needs of the industry over the society. A port was seen as far more important than mixed-use development. The importance of creating livable, accessible public spaces was tragically lost on most governments at the time, including Sydney's. And so this prime location was squandered on a port. By 2003, Port Botany was now the main port of Sydney, and East Darling Harbour was practically empty. So that year, the New South Wales government announced something bold. They were going to transform the 22 hectare East Darling Harbour site into Sydney's newest harbour precinct. NEIS from 2006 stated that, Significant public urban renewal projects have the potential to deliver substantial long-term economic and social benefits to their city. It is the government's intention that the renewal will leverage and strengthen the Sydney CBD well into the 21st century. This was a revolution. This was the beginning of a new era of urban renewal, one that recognised how absolutely essential it was to build cities for people, not for industries. Sydney was about to have its chance to build a place that people wanted to visit. But building this wasn't going to be easy. 
The concept of building a place is known in urban planning as, predictably, placemaking. As this research article puts it, placemaking is an inherently people-centred approach to planning, designing and management of public spaces in cities, as it emphasises the relationships between individuals, communities and urban spaces. It actualises these by enabling and empowering people to create attractive, sociable, healthy and green streets and places. If Sydney was going to transform Barangaroo, it was going to have to put people first. 20 years later, in 2023, this is what has resulted at Barangaroo. The road to this result has been complex, colourful and, quite frankly, very controversial. We'll get to that controversy later on. But first, let's analyse what has resulted at Barangaroo. A result that I feel has been truly spectacular. To begin, we'll analyse transportation, an essential part of any urban precinct, especially as we increasingly rely on public transport over the private car. Indeed, early on, Barangaroo set an ambitious goal of having just 4% of journeys to the area be made by car. How's progress going on this goal? Well, for starters, Barangaroo has easy access to Wynyard Railway Station via Wynyard Walk. Opened in 2016, this is a combination of a tunnel and a pedestrian bridge that links the Barangaroo precinct to Wynyard, allowing pedestrians to avoid the steep inclines of neighbouring roads. Due to this, Barangaroo is just a six minute walk from Sydney's fourth busiest railway station. On top of this, Barangaroo is home to a large ferry hub with two wharves, allowing quick access around the harbour. And Barangaroo is well serviced by buses. As though all of this isn't already enough, Barangaroo will soon be home to its very own metro station. This will provide speedy links to other stations across Sydney CBD, such as Martin Place, Pitt Street and Central, as well as on towards both Chatswood and Bankstown. Opening next year in 2024, renders released of the station look simply stunning. What I feel should be particularly praised is that the Barangaroo metro station will be located here towards the north of the site. This is clever. Those wanting to get to the south can still use Wynyard, and those who want to go to the north will have Barangaroo metro. Connectivity at Barangaroo has been heavily optimised. And to think this is a place that was once completely barred to public access. Let's have a look at economic activity now. The aim with Barangaroo has always been to deliver a dynamic mix of commercial, residential, tourist, retail, community and cultural uses, whilst dedicating 50% of Barangaroo as public open space on or close to the harbour foreshore. Barangaroo is divided into three sections, Barangaroo Reserve, Central Barangaroo and Barangaroo South. Beginning with Barangaroo South, we see an area that embodies everything a mixed-use development should. On its eastern edge, we have the three international towers, comprising three different skyscrapers that stretch up to 270 metres into the sky. They're office towers, and they have the ability to serve a massive 23,000 office workers. I'll be perfectly candid with you. Although they're very architecturally stunning buildings, there is something about their design that doesn't sit completely right with me. They're a bit too tall and they sit a bit too close to one another. But I'm being a bit nitpicky. You can't really expect to build a mixed-use precinct in Sydney CBD without office towers, and these towers definitely satisfy that criteria. But Barangaroo South isn't just offices. There's also residential apartments, with 159 residences spread out between the Anandara and Alexander residences. They are much more architecturally modest buildings. They are far lower in height and therefore blend in far better with their surrounds. One Sydney Harbour, on the other hand, comprises three new residential towers, two of which will rise up to 247 metres into the air. They are currently under construction. Look, I'm all for increased high density, but these towers do kind of feel like a little bit too much. When it comes to Barangaroo, I find myself preferring the apartment complexes that are lower in height, which find their strengths more in a subtle brilliance than the striking gladness of these towers. Barangaroo is also a thriving shopping and restaurant district, with the international towers and residential apartments all having shops and restaurants on their lower levels. There's a grand total of 90 shops and restaurants in Barangaroo South. 
Keen for a read? Head to Tidal Books. Looking for only the most sophisticated in men's suits? There's MJ Bale Barangaroo. Peckish for Mexican? Tequila Daisy. Waterfront got you feeling like some fish? Cirrus Dining. Barangaroo is quickly emerging as the go-to place for quality dining in Sydney CBD. The centrepiece of its dining options is, without a doubt, Barangaroo House, home to three restaurants and bars separated onto its three levels. Its free-flowing curved structure with its overflowing gardens and timber facade evoke a sense of nature and serenity, like three birds' nests stacked upon one another. They're a stark but fitting and even necessary contrast to the surrounding office towers. You see, this is where mixed-use development finds its strengths. An office district finds itself activated when it's integrated with entertainment and dining options. There's no need for Barangaroo to die outside of the hours of 9 to 5 on a weekday. Mixed-use development keeps it alive at all hours. Of course, then we have the Crown Sydney, which honestly has become one of the most controversial buildings to have ever been built in Sydney. Built by billionaire James Packer, it's a six-star hotel that stretches a staggering 271 metres into the sky, with its own restaurants, bars, casino, private residences and penthouses. Most of its controversy lies in what was widely seen as a very inadequate and probably even corrupt planning approval process, but I'll cover that later. Independent of all of that, I do think the building itself has a certain opulence reminiscent of other grand skyscrapers around the world, like the Burj Khalifa and Marina Bay Sands. Every world-class city needs a world-class hotel, and Crown Sydney certainly delivers on that. Central Barangaroo, which will be located right here behind those black fences, is yet to open. But when it does, it will be home to its own mixed-use development zone, with residential, retail and commercial buildings. The key difference between the Central and South Barangaroo districts will be the height of the buildings. Central Barangaroo is set to only have a maximum building height of 35 metres. Personally, I do support this, as I do feel that Barangaroo South's biggest weaknesses are that its buildings are too tall. And besides, we already have tall buildings at Barangaroo South, so you might as well have some shorter buildings in Central Barangaroo. It should therefore have a more inviting, homely feel than the somewhat corporate feel that the tall towers of Barangaroo South evoke. It will also be far more accessible, given that it will be the location of a new metro station. But on top of that, more than 50% of central Barangaroo will be dedicated public open space. Which brings me to the next aspect of Barangaroo that I'd like to analyse. It's public spaces. The strength of a place comes not from those places you must spend money, but from places that people of all groups can gather without spending a cent, with no greater purpose than to just hang out. In this sense, I do feel Barangaroo succeeds. Two words, Barangaroo Reserve. Barangaroo Reserve is the third section of Barangaroo, and it's easily one of the most beautiful parks in all of Sydney. It's a massive six hectare foreshore park that offers breathtaking views of Sydney Harbour, simply perfect for a picnic. Its creation involved reconstructing the natural shoreline of Barangaroo that existed hundreds of years before colonisation. Sandstone was mined from Barangaroo itself and placed along the shoreline, which resulted in a beautiful organic coastline. 75,000 trees were planted in the park. What's special about Barangaroo Reserve is that it's not a bland, flat reserve, but rather constructed entirely around a hill, with different levels, steps and paths between levels, spaces that are open to the air and other spaces that are enveloped by trees. This gives the reserve a sense of discovery as you explore all its different levels and its different spaces. Without a doubt, Barangaroo Reserve has become one of the most prime locations anywhere in Sydney Harbour and I do genuinely feel it makes the most of this location. The cutaway is a gorgeous, massive below-ground concrete void built into the Barangaroo Reserve Hill. This is a beautiful space which can host many events. For the start of 2023, it has been hosting a Frida Kahlo art show. Tragically, the cutaway has been largely underused for years. There were plans to use it for an Aboriginal cultural centre, but these were sadly shelved in August 2022. 
a three-level multi-purpose cultural facility with a gallery, cafe and function spaces will be fitted out into the cutaway instead. Still, it's disappointing that the Aboriginal Cultural Centre will not be going ahead. Barangaroo Reserve is linked to both other parts of Barangaroo through Wulugul Walk. This is a beautiful, breathtaking foreshore promenade with sweeping views of the harbour. Its pathway is very wide and inviting, with trees planted at regular intervals and benches spread out regularly. Now let's turn our attention to Barangaroo's roads. For starters, there really aren't many. This really encourages people to ditch the car. There is a 300 space car park underneath Barangaroo Reserve, and I'm not a fan of that, but fortunately that's it. Unlike most city streets through Sydney CBD, Barangaroo Avenue is clearly designed for pedestrians over cars. After all, you can get to Barangaroo from Wynyard Station, over 600 metres away, and only cross one road, right here, at a pedestrian crossing. There are regular pedestrian crossings, wide footpaths, only two lanes of traffic and very few parking spaces. All a win for pedestrians. The final aspect of Barangaroo I'd like to take a look at is sustainability. This is of course a particularly important category in the 21st century, where the environment must be at the forefront of every planner's mind. Barangaroo is certainly making strides in this regard, as the entire precinct has been certified carbon neutral by the Commonwealth for three years in a row now. This has been achieved through several measures, such as the precinct's 6,000 square metres of solar panels, the usage of water from the harbour for air conditioning rather than drinking water, and diverting more than 80% of waste from landfill. You can tell I have a very positive view of Barangaroo. From a very purely city planning perspective, I just feel like it succeeds in so many aspects. All of this said, Barangaroo has not had unanimous public support at all. The initial winning proposal for Barangaroo, chosen in 2006, was designed by Hill Dallas Architecture. It called for theatres, community buildings, outdoor event spaces, major site-specific public art, a playing field, floating harbour pools beside the green headland, and a sizeable quota of affordable housing. There would only be roughly 388,000 metres squared of floored space within the entire precinct, and over 50% of the precinct would be public space, with an uninterrupted foreshore park stretching from south to north. Credit where credit's due, it was a very beautiful proposal. The tallest permitted tower would be only 180 metres, and even then, that would only be restricted to one of the eight subdivided blocks of Barangaroo. Most towers would be far shorter. Oh, and most notably, there would be no casino. The initial idea for Barangaroo really had people at the centre of it. What resulted was a precinct with not 388,000 metres squared of floor space, but 602,000 metres squared as of the December 2021 plans for Barangaroo, and proposals to increase that even further. In other words, the result had significantly taller buildings than initially proposed. The casino has 75 floors. Only 2.3% of Barangaroo's housing is affordable. And while more than 50% of Barangaroo will be public space once it's done, the other 50% is office space, high-end restaurants, an unaffordable hotel, and a casino only for the richest high rollers. No more continuous foreshore park. The casino is very tall, blocking views of the harbour from Millers Point and Observatory Hill. Architect Philip Dallas of Hill Dallas Architecture describes Barangaroo as an exploitation that squanders opportunities for public land for future generations. The physical manifestation of an opaque and corrupted process. Because the project was a betrayal of the public interest. Rather than sticking to Dallas's winning design, the government did give in to the interests of the private sector and changed their plans, allowing developers a lot of freedom in designing Barangaroo. If the government had not had such vested commercial interests, perhaps Barangaroo would have had more public space, shorter towers, more affordable housing and dining options, and no casino. Critics of Barangaroo largely see the casino as Barangaroo's downfall, as it was not subjected to the proper planning procedures and didn't even have a public tender process. 
In fact, it was a completely unsolicited proposal brought to then Premier Barry O'Farrell by James Packer at a lunch. And obviously only the richest can afford to visit the casino. Architect Peter Tonkin stated that the building is the most overt symbol of the triumph of private benefit over public good that has given us Barangaroo to date. Barangaroo was meant to be for the public, not for a billionaire who wanted to expand his business, not for restaurants many people can't afford, not as a playground for the upper class, but a playground for everyone. City of Sydney Mayor Clover Moore described Barangaroo as developer-led city making that gifts public land to private interests without commensurate public benefit. What should be a magnificent Sydney Harbour precinct, a delight to residents, workers and visitors, is a phallic forest, a monument to greed and poor process carried out by both major parties. This is a damning appraisal. But I don't know. I'm not entirely sure I agree with this negative consensus of Barangaroo. I totally agree with the criticisms that critics such as Clover Moore and Philip Dallas have presented. They all lament what could have been, a space for the public to revel in, to enjoy. I do not at all want to diminish the views of renowned critics like Dallas and Moore, because a lot of their criticisms are right. Most particularly, I do agree that many of Barangaroo's towers are too tall, and I would have preferred buildings that were perhaps half the height. But those critical of the project are firmly in the minority. I'm pretty sure 90% of Sydney siders I ask would call Barangaroo a magnificent Sydney Harbour precinct, despite what Moore has claimed. I didn't draw this number out of my ass. That's how many of my Twitter followers said they like Barangaroo. I think that Barangaroo has become one of Sydney's most beautiful waterfront precincts easily overtaking the concrete Darling Harbour and Circular Quay. I think that, contrary to what some critics implicitly convey, Barangaroo is frequently bustling and alive, far from the dead concrete jungle image some have conjured up. Critics like to suggest that Barangaroo has not brought about enough public benefit. But hasn't it? I mean, I really must ask, what does public benefit actually mean? It's rather vague, isn't it? Journalist Michael Coziol went against the Sydney Morning Herald Tide and wrote a positive article about Barangaroo, questioning this obsession with public benefit, pointing out that, while parks and public squares are wonderful, one cannot live on parks and public squares alone. There is an odd, almost puritanical assertion that because cafes, restaurants and retail are private operations, they do not deliver public benefit. Clover Moore stated that Barangaroo should have offered more for ordinary people who don't have a bank card and people who want to exercise who work and live in the city. Okay, Barangaroo does have a reputation for being pricey, and this is a reputation that is warranted to a decent extent. But we ate there after our shoot at Bell's Chicken and paid about $20 each. Honestly, that's pretty average for a Sydney restaurant. My point is that not every restaurant in Barangaroo is a Michelin star $200 a head dining experience. Furthermore, I personally think the implication by critics like Moore that the everyday Sydney cider is incapable of splurging a bit on fine dining or enjoying some upscale shopping options is inaccurate, out of touch and perhaps even condescending. On the contrary, anyone and everyone can treat themselves every now and then, regardless of wealth. And besides, for those who don't want to spend, Barangaroo Reserve exists. It's open to absolutely everyone and it is simply stunning. And for those who long for even more open public spaces, just wait a few more years for Central Barangaroo to be complete and you'll get it. Michael Coziol accepts and understands the criticisms of Barangaroo, as do I, but he counters critics quite elegantly with this one line. I think this kind of elite and elitist opinion from critics is probably squarely in the minority. Most of us are just glad to be rid of the old maritime eyesore, happy to have somewhere nice to take Bill and Rhonda for lunch, and proud to have a park with views over the most beautiful harbour in the world. Because, after all, that's what we must remember. Barangaroo was once little more than a dry, dull concrete slab that stole away our CBD's western edge, and now it's so much more. As a place, there's no doubt in my mind that Barangaroo emphasises the relationships between individuals, communities and urban spaces, and is home to attractive, sociable, healthy and green streets and places. It isn't perfect, 
shorter towers would have been nicer, and a continuous foreshore park would have been a gorgeous addition to our city. Barangaroo could have been more, and I don't deny that. But why should we let that blind us from the beautiful result that we have? The truth is, most people who visit Barangaroo love Barangaroo. It's accessible, it's sustainable, it's alive and it's bustling. Let us learn from the mistakes we made in building Barangaroo. Offering too much freedom to developers, not pushing projects through the proper planning procedures. And let us grow from these. But more importantly, let us appreciate what has resulted nonetheless. Sydney, we turned a boring, drab concrete slab into Sydney's most renowned urban renewal project in recent memory. That is something we should be proud of. Thank you for watching.